Welcome to a special episode of the Cross Border Interviews. The Association of Manitoba Municipalities recently unveiled its provincial pre-election campaign under the inspiring slogan, Let's Grow Manitoba Together. This campaign seeks to identify key policy priorities that will shape the future of the province. It's an, also an opportunity for municipalities to unite, to foster growth, and to build a prosperous future for all members of the province. So what are the focal points of this crucial campaign? Well, today we'll be diving into the municipal priorities for the 2023 provincial election as outlined by the AMM. First and foremost, they're advocating for fair and predictable municipal funding by establishing a simplified, predictable funding model with an annual escalator working hand-in-hand -hand with municipalities. The AMM wants the province to provide financial stability and empower local governments to better serve their communities. Infrastructure development is also taking center stage in the AMM's vision for Manitoba. They're emphasizing the need to invest in core infrastructure, particularly in water and wastewater systems. Additionally, they are calling for a commitment to a permanent federal and provincial infrastructure fund. Now, investing in people is another key pillar for the AMM's campaign. They propose accelerating a comprehensive provincial strategy to recruit healthcare professionals and paramedics throughout Manitoba, addressing the critical need for medical professions in all regions of the province. Furthermore, the AMM supports implementing recommendations from the Immigration Advisory Committee to increase regional settlement incentives for foreign trained doctors and other professionals. They advocate for training opportunities for licensed professionals closer to home, fostering a skilled workforce within the various Manitoba communities. Addressing public safety concerns is paramount to the AMM's campaign as well. They call on the federal government for bail and conditional release reforms aiming to ensure the safety of their communities. The organization strongly opposes any downloading of policing reform costs and seeks predictable policing resources. Moreover, they advocate for flexibility in relocating certain enforcement and social service functions from police to separate provincially funded authorities, recognizing the challenges posed by crime and drug trafficking. The AMM urges an increase in police funding by all levels of government. Now, as you can see, it is clear that the Association of Manitoba Municipalities is driven by a deep commitment to the needs and concerns of its members. Their advocacy and initiatives aim to achieve a strong and effective municipal government across the province, ensuring a bright and prosperous future for all Manitobians. Now, today we are welcoming onto the show a remarkable guest, someone who has championed the needs and aspirations of Manitoba's 137 municipalities, the president of the Association of Manitoba Municipalities, Cam Bright. Let's get to the interview. Cam, I want to start with this big overarching question, and I wanted to ask this question first before we get into the actual crux of the interview, which is about the campaign that AMA has announced. But I want to start with in your opinion, what is the state of municipalities in the province of Manitoba today? You know, I, I think the municipalities are in, in a great position in Manitoba. We're, I, I think we're on the cusp of a major breakthrough in this province. I, I think you're going to see the province of Manitoba really start to take off and explode, and that starts at the municipal level. Uh, I feel that there's great leadership and uh, amazing administration and uh, a strong will by uh, all those individuals to make their municipalities better and stronger. And there's so much going on in our province, in our province and, and every municipality has so much to offer. I, I think you're going to see that we're really going to break through and uh, uh, really start moving our, you know, our communities and our province forward. Sorry, just to, for clarification's sake, what do you mean by breakthrough? What, what, what breakthroughs are you anticipating uh, municipalities to have in the next few years or even during this, the, the next few months during this campaign, the provincial government is uh, undertaking? Well, I, I almost think that Manitoba has been kind of one of the, the best kept secrets 
uh, you know, especially municipalities. And it, it really opened my eyes uh, during COVID when you, you know, technically weren't allowed to leave the province. And, uh, you know, I, I did a lot of touring around at that time. And um, also as being president and a part of the, uh, the executive with AMM, we get a tour and visit all 137 municipalities. And you don't realize what amazing things the Manitoba has to offer. And every municipality is unique and there's so much positivity, so many uh, great things going on in all these municipalities. But I think just the, the rest of the world, to a certain extent, is starting to realize that and that we are a great place to invest in, whether it just be in, in your families or uh, economically. And, uh, you know, I, I think we're on the cusp of some, some major economic breakthroughs here in this province. We have a lot to provide uh, to the rest of the world. And I think, uh, you know, investors not only from Manitoba, but across the country and across this, uh, you know, internationally, uh, are really starting to realize. And I think that's going to take off. We just need some support provincially and federally to make this all happen. Bill, one of the big things, the reason why you're here is to talk about the Let's Grow Manitoba Together campaign that AMM announced early in May of 2023. And this is the campaign that's leading up to the provincial election. What, in your words, are the main goals and objectives of this campaign heading into the 2023 provincial election from a municipal standpoint? Well, let's be honest, you know, I guess in the, the grand scheme of things, uh, uh, publicly through the media, et cetera, municipalities just aren't that sexy. Uh, you know, that's not a, you know, a popular conversation, you know, a popular topic that's going to hit the, uh, the, the news waves when uh, the election is, you know, in full swing, especially come, you know, September, August, September, et cetera. So we try to get ahead of the game a little bit and make sure the municipal issues were front and center right off the bat. Uh, because municipal issues re have impacts on every single person that lives in the province of Manitoba. And so we're just trying to get that message out there before a lot of the other groups and a lot of the other interests are, uh, you know, campaigning as well and trying to get their uh, concerns and thoughts heard. So uh, we, we came out kind of early. Uh, we timed it around our um, uh, spring convention where we're able to have the, the uh, first ever for AMM uh, provincial leaders forum. And we couldn't really call it a debate because the election hasn't officially been uh, called, but it was absolutely phenomenal to be able to have all the major leaders from our parties, um, you know, front and center in front of our delegates talking about municipal issues. So we've been able to have that conversation and we're continuing to help, um, you know, uh, work with the parties to possibly craft their platforms so that municipal issues are front and center or at least a part of that platform. So we just wanted to be a part of the conversation. I think we succeeded greatly there. The platform, the sort of priorities that AMA has, uh, AMM, sorry, has uh, put out center around four different priorities. And I, I know, speaking to municipal leaders from across this country, that the issues in the southern part of a province are not the exact same in the northern part or east, west, urban, rural. How did the uh, organization come up with these key four priorities for this provincial election and what they are hoping to hear from the provincial leaders? You know, I, and once again, Chris, I'll, I'll touch on the fact that uh, being the president of this association gives me great privilege and great honor with my executive and district directors and some staff to travel around the province of Manitoba and meet with all 137 municipalities uh, over a uh, course of about three to four years. And during these municipal visits, we hear the same thing time and time and time again. And that is what how we crafted the four key pillars for our uh, platform for our, our campaign. It, it's we're just trying to bring the voices forward uh, from all of our municipalities, and they're all you know saying the same thing: we need help in these areas. And it's all uh, items that I, I think will resonate with all the parties, and they will be major uh, election type topics and issues. And so we're just trying to bring this message forward. And we're also, you know, we're, we're trying to let them know that we want to be a part of the solution. We want to come, we're, we're solution oriented group. We're not just coming forward with our handout, asking for handouts and gimme, gimme, gimme. Okay. We want to be a part of that solution, but in order to be a part of the solution, we need to be a part of the process. And so we're just trying to bring, you know, bring the concerns forward and be a part of that process to help um, the, the, the provincial governments or the provincial parties understand all these decisions, how each municipality is impacted, because you're correct. No two municipalities are impacted the exact same. And so, you know, it's not a one size fits all type of approach that needs to be taken. And so we're just trying to bring that voice forward. One of the pillars is uh, the funding of fairness and predictability around uh, economics and uh, sort of money uh, that municipalities are looking for. 
what would it mean for municipalities to have predictable funding from the next provincial government? And particularly, what would it mean for predictable funding with an annual escalator? Because th those are your words, the AMM's words that I'm using here. So what would that mean for municipalities across the province of Manitoba? Well, that'll be absolutely huge, Chris. You know, municipalities are not allowed to run a deficit. Okay, but we have to balance the books every. We're the only level of government that's not around, allowed to run a, a deficit. But so often we get put into a reactionary state because of decisions by the federal and provincial government. And so what this will allow us to do, if we can get the predictable amount, and I, I'm not talking about having our funding frozen again. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm talking about you know making sure that we've got a predictable amount that's got a built-in escalator that we can plan going forward for. We don't want to have to live from paycheck to paycheck or uh, you know on a yearly basis. We want to plan 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road uh, because you know, we're very progressive in thinking and we're municipalities on the move. And we also, you know, we have residents that are there, are, quite frankly, are asking for a lot because it's a competition to keep people living in your communities, as well as attracting um, economic um, investments and retaining, um, you know, the, the employees and the people that are working in your community. So we need to make sure that we're looking 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. And we need to make sure that we have predictable funding put in place that we can actually budget based on and, and plan around. So that's what we're asking for. And we've had we received strong um, commitments to a certain extent from all of or from the, the different parties. It's just going to be, you know, how does that shake out and how does it look? How does it look? What like we talk about a predictable funding model, and I think uh, the Manitoba is not alone in asking for that particular uh, uh, predictable funding model. What would you want as president of the organization? What is the first step in this predictable funding model? Because I can imagine you you can ask, but if you don't have the follow through and say, okay, this is what we need. This is what it's not going to happen. So, what is AMM looking for in the first step? Well, there's many steps in this, and, and we, we brought forward a lot of different thoughts and ideas. And, and right now, uh, with the current sitting government, we have a, um, uh, a, a stakeholders group uh, that sits down together between ourselves and the, the province of Manitoba and uh, key departments. And so we're constantly looking at different ideas and crunching numbers and, and looking at ways that we can make this work and be something that uh, works for everyone. One of the, the key things that we're bringing forward is that a per capita funding model is not the uh, the best answer for all municipalities. Okay, so you know we have in, in Manitoba uh, we have a lot of resort communities. Uh, those resort communities, uh, you know, th their population will triple, quadruple, etc. Come summertime, and but the per capita funding model does not reflect that. And so yet they, they have a lot of expenses, a lot of challenges uh, providing all those services to those uh, in, to that increase in population for a uh, four or five month period of time. And so you know, for instance, in that sense, we need to look at a different funding model. Or we have a lot of municipalities that cover a massive expanse of uh, uh, infrastructure, roads, et cetera, uh, geographically, but yet have a very small population. But yet they have to provide the necessary services and maintenance to the residents to, to maintain all that infrastructure. And, and that costs money. So it's that's where the per capita funding structure just does not quite fit for all. And so we're it's we're, we're looking at a needs base, but that, that's you know that's kind of difficult to uh, qualify as to what. Uh, the true needs of our municipality are and how do you weigh it out against another municipality so we're trying to get creative but we're also we're, we're going back to our members and asking for information from them uh we're trying to make sure that they're part of that process and providing all the information possible so that we can make the desk and you land in the best spot going forward one of the other areas that uh the organization and the campaign is calling for is the next provincial government to give a rebate for the PST paid for by municipalities federal uh similar to the federal GST rebate uh would that be a substantial benefit to all municipalities we talk about small large urban rural uh the money you pay PST coming back to you i'm assuming is a win win no matter where you are in the province Absolutely. You know, that that would be something that impacts every single municipality in a positive way. Uh, it, it's we're, we're not talking a massive amount of money. It's twenty five million dollars. Uh, it, it's what was estimated a, a number of years ago. But, you know, that's still huge for a lot of municipalities uh, or well, for all municipalities. Um, it, it's quite frustrating uh, for them to be, you know, taxed by another level of government. And it just doesn't seem, you know, it doesn't make sense. And, you know, quite often there's there's great announcement. There's contributions uh, being made by the provincial government saying, we're going to contribute X number of you know thousands or millions of dollars to this project. Uh, you know, that's excellent. 
but they get a lot of that back or most of that back in PST. Um, so, you know, it, it would, it, it would be a great step forward uh, to see our, you know, the, 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 the uh, municipalities um, uh, rebated for PSTs or, you know, just plain simply exempt from it. So that is something we're going to continue to work for. That's going to be one part of the platform, one part of the ask, uh, but, but there still needs to be more because uh, municipalities are a great investment. And that's exactly what we are. We, you know, we, we wanted to make sure that the provincial and federal governments are investing in us and let us help grow Manitoba together. And I think that we'll see the province of Manitoba reaping the rewards of just that. One of the other key uh, pillars of the campaign is the investiture of uh, infrastructure funding and particularly the increased funding to Manitoba's Water Services Board and wastewater infrastructure. How would this benefit communities across Manitoba? Because I know the day you launched the campaign, the backdrop was a wastewater facility in, if I'm not mistaken, Winnipeg, correct me if I'm wrong. So how would that benefit all communities across Manitoba? Well, once again, this is something that we hear uh, nonstop when we make, you know, travel across the province of Manitoba. You know, just right now in Manitoba, we have roughly 300 plus projects that are ready to go today and have identified totaling over $976 million. Uh, you know, so we need the not only the provincial government, but we need the federal government to step up and really assist with this because we actually, believe it or not, in 2023, there's a lot of municipalities and First Nation communities in our province that do not have access to clean, potable drinking water. This is 2023. And so every single Manitoba, first of all, deserves that. Um, you know, and, and also, you know, a, a couple of years back, we had the municipalities that, you know, were able to provide uh, clean, potable drinking water to the residents, ran into challenges with drought and not being able to supply clean, potable drinking water to the residents. So we need to make sure we got that security in place. But further to that, we have, uh, you know, wastewater requirements that are uh, put onto us with regulation from the provincial government uh, that it's, it's massive expenditures to upgrade our wastewater systems. And, you know, we, we certainly need some assistance in that sense. We're, we're having to turn away economic development and economic uh, investment because of that. And so we, we need to work together strategically with the province and federal government to try and get more dollars flowing so we're not turning away investment. Um, you, you, you look at just doing, you know, waterline renewal in municipalities is costing millions of dollars just to do these renewals. And, you know, for, for some smaller municipalities, that, that's a massive expenditure. And in some cases, you know, they're, they're, having, they're only getting 33% funding. So it's very difficult for these municipalities to come up with that funding themselves. And that's not increasing their capacity. That's just being able to maintain their capacity uh, that they currently have. And so it's, it's something that is a massive issue for municipalities across the province of Manitoba. And we're, you know, we're working with the province and, and, and the federal government taking a regional approach to try and find ways to, uh, you know, leverage every dollar and, and take advantage of every dollar as best we possibly can. But this is something that is absolutely critical to the growth and the sustainability of the province of Manitoba. Now, I, I've, I've had the pleasure to speak to your counterparts in Saskatchewan and in uh, Alberta, Kathy Heron and Randy Golden from Saskatchewan and Alberta, respectively. And they also talk about infrastructure. In Alberta, in the last election, they announced that there was a $30 billion deficit for infrastructure needs that municipalities are facing. Now, infrastructure funding is not just water and wastewater facilities, it's roads, it's what's underneath the ground. Um are municipalities in a good position in Manitoba when it comes to the infrastructure funding that they're getting already? Because in the campaign, it seems that you're focusing on the wastewater and water uh, 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 infrastructure needs more than, say, the roads and everything else. Uh, you know, we need to see a massive increase in the uh, infrastructure funding. We we really do. And, you know, we could have came forward with uh, 10 pages uh, filled with individual asks. Uh, you know, so we're just trying to highlight some of the, the, the key points that we're bringing forward, just provincially and federally, because we're lobbying the federal, federal government as well to, you know, come forward because the province can't do this alone. Uh, and, and so, you know, we talked about uh, it earlier. It can't be a one size fits all. Uh, program and we need to make sure that there's flexibility and these grant funding opportunities and and that's you know the federal grants especially um you know, too often those grants uh you are put forward and it's like well it's going to work great in ontario and quebec so it's going to work great for everyone else uh well not in manitoba you know in manitoba for instance you, you can see your dog you can watch a dog run away for three days 
Okay, that's how flat we are. Like our, our our geographical layout is just that much different than everywhere else, and and we only have one you know one center that's over a hundred thousand people. So you know we are different. So that's we're we're focusing uh, we're focusing on the larger ticket items, you know, which is water and wastewater. But uh, we, we need uh, serious help with connectivity, uh, broadband, uh, you know, cell, cellular connectivity, et cetera, et cetera, across the province of Manitoba. And we need to see greater investment there uh, because so so much is going towards uh, centralization of services and uh, the virtual and hybrid option uh, format. And whether it be uh, learning from home or doing just, you know, working from home, uh, doctor's appointments, et cetera. And there's a lot of individuals in, in our province that do not have, uh, high speed internet or you know proper cell phone connectivity. There's a lot of dead spots or no connectivity at all. So you know there's there's that, and then you know what uh, highways. Who doesn't need better infrastructure? You go from one coast to the coast to coast in, in Manitoba or in, in Canada, and everyone needs to see improvements in infrastructure. And, and once again, I go back to it, it can't just be the provinces alone that are doing this. The federal government needs to step up, and we need to start uh, taking uh, our core infrastructure deficits seriously across this country and see proper investments in that. I, I, I will be the second to echo the comments about the cell phone and wi uh, wireless uh, internet issues of Manitoba, because I, every time I approach one of your members, mayors or Reeves or counselors to come on the show, usually they ask, is it by phone or is it by internet? If it's by internet, I can't come on. So hopefully yeah. there will be some big changes in Manitoba in the future. But you mentioned one thing that I want to jump on here, and it's another pillar, and it's healthcare. Um AMM is calling for a provincial strategy to recruit healthcare professionals and paramedics in all communities across the province. Now, this is a big ask for any uh, municipality because we are seeing municipalities suffer because of closures of ERs. We are seeing uh, residents suffer because the wait times to get a paramedic. Are you hearing anything from the provincial government or the opposition parties to make you sort of feel a little bit more at ease that this is a priority for them because this is not just a municipal issue. This is a provincial issue that everyone should be taking more seriously. Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons why it's one of, one of our uh, four key asks. And it's, it's something that impacts every single Manitoban and it is something that every single Man Manitoban can relate to. Uh, so th this is something we know is going to be a, a hot topic. Uh, COVID just, you know, uh, certainly amplified that, right? Uh, so well, I, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, the, the challenges that we're facing here today cannot, it's just not fair to put it on any of the current sitting governments that had to go through COVID. This is like, I, I think decades worth of governments have neglected and, and taken uh, our healthcare system for granted. There's a lot of complacency that came into place and we were not investing properly or properly planning going forward uh, for this day. And so what happened during COVID just accelerated the problem with, uh, you know, you know the staffing shortages or staff moving on uh, and proper succession planning was not in place. And so now we have such a competitive environment out there that we're competing not just against uh, other municipalities uh, or, or other provinces, but uh, internationally. And it's that that's a steep, steep, uh, you know, hill to overcome. So. We, we, we do recognize that it, this is not going to be a quick fix. This isn't something that any government, I don't care who takes power, uh, you know, late October, they're not going to fix this overnight. And we as municipalities understand and recognize that. But all we want to know is that there is a plan and we want to see and hear what that plan is. And so that we can better understand it and be a part of that solution to implement that plan and help see that plan through. Every single Manitoban deserves good quality care close to home and we've lost that we're not asking for brand new health healthcare facilities in every single municipality absolutely not we realize and recognize that those days are long gone but that doesn't mean that we can't be strategic about it and have certain uh, hospitals or healthcare facilities placed in certain areas with proper staffing levels so that members or for, so that individuals can get good quality care in a timely fashion but that takes consultation and communication and dialogue with municipal leaders who know their communities the best and so once again, I go back to the, you know, we want to be a part of the solution, but darn it, we have to be a part of the process as well. So bring us in. Let's have that conversation. Let's hear what your plan is. Let's sit down and let's discuss that plan because I guarantee you, we will point out some holes and some flaws that's in that, that plan. But, you know, let us help, you know, uh, create that and mold that together so that it can be in the best interest of all Manitobans. If we do nothing, people are going to, sorry, Chris, if we do nothing, people are going to continue to migrate towards the larger centers where the healthcare facilities are. 
and we're going to see a declining population in the rural and we're going to see the local healthcare facilities facilities in these large urban centers really struggle and suffer and people that are living in those communities that are used to de- you know quick response times are going to see massive delays because of the increase in population i'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate with you here for a second cam because you're right they're not going to be able to fix it the day after the next election but the issue isn't happening the day after the next election it's happening now the the hospitals and the issues that are prominent in rural communities or even the overload of some urban centers hospitals are happening as we speak are you hearing anything from the provincial government or even the opposition parties to have that discussion now because you can't wait till after the election and see who's going to get in you need to start having those conversations now Absolutely. We've been having these conversations for uh, quite some time now. And uh, there is movement by the current provincial government. They're actively recruiting uh, you know, healthcare professionals from across the world. They certainly are. Um, and, and I do know that the opposition parties do also have a plan that they're bringing forward. Um, you know, it, it's it's the execution of that plan that's going to matter the most and how it's going to be um, accepted and, and acknowledged by those other individuals that they're trying to recruit and bring in. And, and it's one thing to recruit. It's another to retain them. And so that, that is something that, you know, we, we need to make sure that plan is in place. And the retention part of it is also, and, and the recruitment, is municipalities play a big role in that uh, because we have to sell our communities uh, to these individuals. And we want to make sure and ensure that it's a welcoming community for them to come in and, and, and um, you know, raise their families or just to be a part of. And so that it's we are seeing that there's movement and it will never happen fast enough uh, for people. But once again, I, we're just asking for better communication on this and to make sure that uh, we are taking uh, into consideration the municipal concerns and challenges and input. You've talked openly over the last 20 minutes on the show so far about uh, the federal government's role in these issues as well. And in the uh, platform, the Let's Grow uh, Manitoba Together campaign, you're asking the province to press the federal government on bail reform while also calling on the province to increase social spending on programs that will help municipalities in all corners of the province. What increases are you hoping to see in social services to ensure that municipalities have the right tools to help its residents, but help their residents feel safe in their communities? Yeah, this is a pretty loaded question. This is a real (laughs) difficult one as well, uh, because it's uh, uh, many tiers of government play a massive role in this. And, And so, you know, in regards to social spending, we're, we're one of one of the key things is there's um, a program, a community safety and well-being program that's been uh, there's been funding provided by the provincial government to certain municipalities. I, I believe it's a dozen municipalities have uh, received funding in this regard, and we're asking them to open this up to all municipalities who would like to work together and put together a plan like this. Um, you know, th- this just gives concrete direction uh, for the uh, the RCP or, or the local policing services to to uh, follow the initiatives and, and the, the key concerns that municipalities have. And it just makes sure that everyone's on the same page. And once again, it comes down to communication. It just opens up the lines of communication, the dialogue. And uh, so we're, we're asking for an increase in funding in that sense to make sure that other municipalities could take advantage of this if, it, if they so desire. As well as, you know, there's a community safety officer program, which the provincial government has brought forward. We welcome it. It is great. Uh, you know, some, for some municipalities, it's going to work. You know, work excellent. But not all municipalities have the capacity to be able to uh, implement that. Uh, there's massive costs that are associated with this because it would be municipal, municipal owned and operated, and not all municipalities can afford to do that. And you know, public safety, the, the funding truly does come largely from the, you know the federal and provincial governments, and we need to make sure that that funding is there. It can't be something else that's just you know downloaded onto municipalities. Um, and, and you're 100 correct. We've we've been continuing to call on the province of Manitoba to uh, speak out against uh, Bill Bill 75 and bail reform, which we have done as well. And I know the province has. Um, I, I've uh, had the pleasure of uh, meeting with Minister Medicino twice on this, uh, you know, a couple of these issues. And it, it's a constant revolving door. Uh, we are already short staffed with RCMP and, and policing officials in uh, in Manitoba, and a lot of our you know short staff members are spending a lot of time. Reapp- reapprehending these repeat offenders and they're spending so much time catching these criminals that are consistently breaking the law uh you know we were hearing some individuals being caught 300 times uh, doing the same thing um you know they obviously are not getting the message uh so we, we need to find ways to uh, do something about this revolving door and the catch and release program that's in place but also let's make sure that the the services are there and the infrastructure is there and the resources are there to get the help 
for those individuals that want the help. And so we're asking, you know, both provincial and federal governments to make sure and invest in these programs to try and help the individuals that actually truly do want to help themselves. Now, you mentioned a key word there. I, 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 I perked my ears perked up the moment you said the word downloading. You are seeing municipalities are seeing a lot of downloading of uh programs and even uh, financial bills from the federal government that you probably hadn't seen uh, 10, 15 years ago. The province and the federal government are asking municipalities to do more with less money on issues around social services, around uh, helping their communities feel safe. If there's nothing done around this bail reform that you're asking the province to advocate to the federal government, what happens? What happens with municipalities if they're asking to be to do more with less and it can't be done. Well, uh, what you're going to see is you're going to see a decline in population. You're going to see uh, a loss of investment. Uh, you're going to see investment just leave your municipality as well. You can see investment coming in uh, because they want to locate in a safe area. And uh, the, the crime is so rampant. You know, a lot of our retail spaces are having a real difficult time with, you know, with, with property theft. And, uh, you know, that, that's a real challenge. It's impacting their bottom line. Basically, the decisions of the federal government when it comes to bail reform, uh, it, it's actually passing the buck right down to the citizens and the, the local business owners. And it, it's for them to absorb and to take on. And that is just plain not right and not fair. Um, it's not society's problem to deal with uh, in this sense. And, it, you know, it's a small percentage of individuals that are creating 99 percent of these issues. And so, you know, and, and in some cases, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to be frank. You just can't. Help. There's some people that just don't want to be helped. There's some people that just, you know, and so we have to address those individuals differently. But once again, let's make sure we get the help to those individuals that do want to be helped. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and also, you know, it, it might come down to the fact that municipalities are going to, you know, increase the police forces themselves. Um, or, you know, pr start to provide these community safety officers on their dime and on their budget. But that will mean a lot of other services and other projects, et cetera, are not going to get done and taxes will rise. So, you know, just, you know, we talked about downloading the, R the RCMP unionization. Uh, that's a $5.1 million bill for some municipalities, uh, you know, uh, certain municipalities across our province. In some cases, you know, one, one municipality is, um, is $1.1 million in retroactive costs. That's close to a 10% tax increase to their members to cover off that retroactive cost, but it's not an increase or improvement in services to the municipality. Um, and, and just like, you know, more downloading, if, you know, our, our prime minister in the last election what got, came out and said that every, or every officer that's going to be interacting with the public will be required to wear a body-worn camera. Hey, that, that sounds great. You know, I, I understand that. That's great. But what we failed to mention is municipalities will be picking up that tab. So we need the federal government to stop making promises and negotiating with our wallets um, and, and make municipalities whole. Uh, we're constantly trying to do more with less. And thank God we're so super resilient and creative. Uh, but, you know, there's there's a limit. And, uh, you know, our residents are going to be paying the ultimate price. And that's the last thing that we want to see. So what does AMM want to hear from the party leaders in the next few months? Because we're in June, we're recording in June, and we're coming into the summer months with which, let's be honest, most people don't pay attention to the news because they're out cam uh, uh, camping or vacationing. So what is your organization and you going to do over the next few months until the quote unquote official start of the campaign period to ensure that these issues that we've talked about today don't just fall silent? You know, that, and that's a great question. You know, and I have to give full credit to all parties in Manitoba. Uh, they've actually, they've reached out and they're asking questions about what we're bringing forward and what our concerns are. And so that dialogue is happening. And, you know, full credit to all of our municipal members across the province too. They're relaying these, the, these concerns. They're having those conversations with their local MLAs and the candidates going forward. So we're just, once again, trying to work hard to make sure that our message is heard and that our concerns are heard. And uh, we're going to continue to do that. We're going to continue to work with all municipal officials and staff to make sure they fully understand the uh, the challenge the municipalities are facing, and but also how it will positively impact the province of Manitoba by working with us in this sense. You know, like, we're, once again, we're not coming with our handles. We're not just here, you know, asking for, you know, me, 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 me. We're coming forward with a solution that's going to benefit everyone. And once, we just want to be a part of that process going forward. And the conversation, the dialogue will continue.
And what do you hope that residents take away from this campaign? Because at the end of the day, you can talk to the politicians, you can talk to the your members, but at the end of the day, residents vote. And I know your members are residents as well, but what are you hoping that the residents will take away from this campaign and think about when they go into that ballot box in October, potentially? Yeah, well, I, I want them to make sure and think what did, uh, what is the province or the, sorry, all the different parties promise in this sense? What, what are they going to do about some of these concerns? Because every single concern that we've brought forward directly impacts every single individual. And so th these are, these are uh, situations and circumstances and issues that impact every single Manitoban and that they can resonate with. And we just want to make sure that they give that some serious consideration when they go forward and vote. We want to thank Cam for coming in and sitting down and chatting with us about the Let's Grow Manitoba Together campaign. To our viewers, thank you for tuning in and for being part of this conversation. If you've enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of our latest interviews and special episodes. We have some amazing guests lined up and we can't wait to share their stories with you. Now, if you're able to, please consider backing the show to help us continue to grow and produce more high quality content like today's episode. Every little bit helps and we appreciate your support. A link to our Patreon account is in our show notes. Now, don't forget to also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for more behind-the-scenes content, show updates, and so much more. And finally, as much as we love our phones and technology, let's remember, put them down. Go have a conversation in real life with the people in our lives now, even if it's just for five minutes. And thanks again for watching another great episode of the Cross-Border Interviews. Remember. Just keep talking.